Oh. Okay. Wanted to give it about five minutes, but we could just play the music in the meantime. Thanks for joining us, folks. We're going to give it a minute listening to this uh, local San Franciscan um, rapping about San Francisco Chinatown. Thanks for the warm-up music, Clint. Um, welcome, everybody. That was Son of Paper, a local musician, native Chinatown boy. Um, and welcome. This is the fourth in a series based on inspecting our foundation. Um, I hope that a number of you have looked at the Inspecting Our Foundation website and the report. Um, we looked at our over 100 year history at Public Works and examined our department's role in the development and character of our city. This is our grounding. And from here, we can grow and change in a racially equitable way. Um, as we start this, we wanna give shout outs to Ben Peterson and Julian Pham, who are both part of the communications team here at Public Works. Ben is the primary researcher and writer and conceived of the method of thinking about our history. There weren't precedents for this, and Ben was aided by two University of San Francisco fellows, Eliana Butler and Sophia Sanchez. Julian devised and designed a way to communicate 60 pages of writing and bibliographical information in a user-friendly and rich manner. Julian's design engages us and makes our complex history accessible and multidimensional. So each month on the last Thursday at lunchtime, we present a topic tied to the Inspecting Our Foundations report. 
Um, we've hosted a diversity of voices, topics, and presentations, and those recordings are on the racial equity page on the Hub. And if you have any ideas, please reach out and let us know, because um, that would be really helpful to know what our um, public works community um, is interested in. This presentation is in collaboration with Asian American Pacific Islander Heritage Month. This year's programming looks at what distinguishes Asian American and Pacific Islander ethnicities and what our similarities are. You can find the recorded panels on the Public Works YouTube channel. And we're looking forward to the culminating potluck on Wednesday, May 31st at 49 South Venice. Today's discussion is Public Works and the Chinatown Alleyways, a private public partnership. It ties this chapter from the report thematically to AAPI Heritage Month. And the program goes hyper-local into San Francisco's Chinatown. It's a great opportunity to discuss how we work with the community to achieve results that respond to community needs and how community voices are incorporated in decision-making about public space. I have the pleasure of introducing Reverend Norman Fong, who is in conversation with the landscape architect, Jasmine Ka. So Norman Fong started at Chinatown Community Development Center as program director in 1990. He became the executive director of the organization in 2011 and retired this year. Uh, founded in 1977, CCDC is an award-winning community development corporation with a comprehensive program of community organizing, neighborhood planning, affordable housing development, property management, and resident services. Norman emphasized the importance of resident engagement and developing grassroots leadership to promote improved quality of life, quality housing, and safe communities. Recognizing a need for youth programming, Norman created a youth-led and run Adopt an Alleyway program to improve the conditions in Chinatown through leading tours. Jasmine Ka bridges public works and the community. Um, she authored the Chinatown Alleyways master plan when she was on staff at CCDC. Her master thesis, Turning Fish Heads into Fillets, featured SF's Chinatown alleyways potential as pedestrian passageways and much needed open space for the densely populated community. She's been a landscape architect for, at Public Works for close to 24 years, and she is one of the women featured in our Snapshots podcast, Women Leaders in Public Service, which you can check out on SoundCloud. So let me turn it over to Jasmine and Nor Re Reverend Norman Fong. Thank you, Robin. Wow, what a treat it is, Norman, to have you here today. Um, you know, when we were planning this talk, I um, said to Robin and, and Beth, uh, hey, look, you know, we got to have Norman here. Norman is the key person for Chinatown and Chinatown Alleyway. So thank you for making the time to be here. Um, so, yeah, so I'm going to just dive right into the first question, which is about who you are. Um, you know, just tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, I, you know, not just your role as, as a, uh, you know, staff of Chinatown Resource Center. When you started, it was Resource Center and then Chinatown Community Development Center later. Uh, but also just about your relationship to Chinatown um, and, you know, particularly about sort of growing up um, you know, your experiences, but also you are a sort of multidimensional person that I know, you know, uh, you, you are a community organizer at heart, but you have a lot of activities with church. Um, you also have a rock band. So let's just tell us about yourself and just sort of your, your general take on, you know, public spaces in Chinatown as well. Okay, everybody yawn. <laughs> so uh, I'll try to be quick. Um, so I was born in 1951, and so you know how old I am. And I'm a Chinatown kid, but not only that, um, my mom was born and raised in Chinatown and never left since 1919. And um, I grew up in the 50s. Uh, at uh, I went to elementary school in Chinatown, the Gene Parker School. Hey, anybody from Gene Parker? Okay. Anyway, uh, at that time, since this is... Uh, 
to incorporate um, racism too in some way. Uh, you know, all the teachers were white and all us kids were segregated in Chinatown. So all of us grew up in Chinatown that went to school there. So I didn't even know what segregation was, but I mean, that that's the, the context. Um, I love uh, growing up in Chinatown. I thought America was Chinese because I've seen all the Chinese there. <laughs> but in some ways I learned to um, about the impact. Um, uh, basically, um, oh, also I should mention my dad. My dad uh, came in 1992 and uh, he went through Angel Island. So the Chinese Exclusion Act. So my main emphasis has been getting our community included and fighting for other communities as well. So I didn't know um, the planning department and not, you know, uh, public works and all that. All I knew is this. So I, I lived at Cameron House, Joyce Alley in Sacramento and Joyce Alley in 1979. I worked there as a youth minister and ran programs there. And all I knew is that I had to push all the garbage from the alleyway to the main streets. Someone named Enid Lim told me to do that because some of our alleyways were not covered or dedicated for maintenance. And so I go, this is kind of weird. Why am I pushing furniture, illegal dumping on clay and, and Sacramento? But thank you to all those cool deep DPW trucks that always came by because I knew them. <laughs> Anyway, so so I didn't know the big picture. I don't know about institutional racism, about neighborhoods not being included for cleaning. Uh, but uh, after, after I joined Chinatown's TDC, I was asked um, to look in the alleyways by the kids. I'm going to the second question now, huh? Oh, yeah. No, please go ahead. Okay. Um, yeah, well, you know. So you, yeah. you, so I went to Chinatown CDC and a, a bunch of old people there, anyway, <laughs> including myself. And I said, there should be youth engaged because in the end, the bottom line is that we got to get our youth to care about our neighborhoods. And so I met with Galileo High School where I, I went to high school too, and met with eight youth there, including the president of the student body. And I knew them from you know my youth, uh, program days. And I asked them one question only. I said, what do you hate about Chinatown? And they responded, all of them, the alleyways. They grew up in the alleyways in, in, in Chinatown too. And uh, that started it. Um, pretty much they wanted to focus on alleyways. And you, know, and you have to picture this. It's not like today, right? Picture all these giant dumpsters that Jasmine, you hope this get rid of through your master plan. But anyway, um, all kudos go to you. But anyway, so it, it was a mess. The rats, the restaurants poured out their junk in the alleyways. Everyone dumped uh, their garbage in the alleyways because um, in Chinatown, half of Chinatown, you all know, are single room occupancies. A hundred people living in one building and with inadequate garbage pickups and stuff like that. So anyway, picture and smell the mess. And I did not know at the time that we were starting a movement. Well, we you, you certainly did. And, and I think, you know, going from Cameron House, did you go to directly to Chinatown Resource Center as a right. program director after Cameron House? Yeah, 1990. Yeah. yeah. So. So I think, was there an alleyway improvement program when you started, or is this something that you you began at, at Chinatown Resource Center? I started the, uh, the youth engagement part, youth adopted an alleyway and Chinatown tours. But um, I remember Joyce Alley being fixed up thanks to Mui Ho's plan, the original right. Berkeley plan. Yes. And and that's where my son, my son learned his learned his ABCs. Mm -hmm. through the alleyway because I thought that was unique and then I hated all the cars blocking both sides so you could mm -hmm. barely go through so right. I learned the importance of bollards and trees yes. and Joyce well, Alley. We we met the two of us met in 19 I think it was 1992 
99 to 93, because I was in graduate school at Berkeley. And when, when Yui Ho, who was, who's an architect and also a professor at Berkeley at the time, um, you know, I was talking to her about doing a thesis and sort of on back streets and urban alleys in general. And she said, well, you know, you got to go speak to Norman, the Reverend Norman Fong. <laughs> and so I just called you, called, I think I just did a cold call one day and yeah. you welcomed me with open arms and, you know, the first day and, um, and, you know, we've had a long history since. And so at the time, I think, um, you know, Chinatown community, you know, led by China, you know, Chinatown CDC was called Chinatown Resource Center at the time. Um, and Mui Ho, the architect, I think there was a national endowment um, for the arts funds that really uh, Chinatown CDC initiated and applied for this grant to do a uh, assessment, right? Like uh, open space assessment of looking at potentially increasing, uh, you know, Chinatown's capacity to have more outdoor uh, environments where people could, you know, live and play because of the density and the SROs that you mentioned, the house, you know, the, the, the density of the community. And so, I mean, I think that was the beginning to me. I think of the alleyway program is kind of like the, you know, the, the potential of the alleyways including rooftop spaces and other sort of open spaces was studied in this brief um, report. And that kind of, um, you know, became this advocacy tool, I think, for Chinatown. It, 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 yeah, do you recall that? Yeah. Yes, and, and also there was a 701 study of Chinatown uh, done in 1970 something that mentioned the high density, the need right. for open space, need for transit and need for uh, um, I think we even got, we found a pot of money that you call Trammell Crow, but but back in, uh, in the old days, we got Louise Rennie to change that mitigation fund to include alleys. I oh, remember that was okay. a big one in the 80s, yeah. She was a but city anyway. attorney, yeah, yeah, yeah. So no, that's great. Um, so I think the advocacy part of the community, you know, um, looking, obviously CCDC as a nonprofit, looking out for the community's needs, you know, and, and what you witness firsthand in Joyce Alley. Um, I think those really help to kind of initiate these city improvement programs that, you know, uh, say an agency like Public Works may not be aware of or know of. So I think the importance of this, um, you know, the nonprofits in, in, in these neighborhoods that we have in the city is so critical and I think when I look back on the my time in Chinatown CDC, I feel like the Chinatown CDC and, and Chinatown community as a whole was really ahead of the game, right? In terms of community organizing, bringing awareness of communities' needs to the city's forefront. And you have, you know, I I looked at you, I, I admired you in terms of your leadership in organizing and advocating. For, for this community for many, many years, and you still do, you know, <laughs> every, every other, every, you know, a few other, a few, every few weeks I see you on TV, you know, <laughs> uh, leading, leading a speech or leading a protest of some kind. Um, so, I mean, you know, you, you are, are sort of this, you know, a very quintessential, you know, piece of Chinatown's history and why Chinatown is what it is today, at least, at least in my perspective. I'll um, treat you to lunch later. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so let's switch to that. I, I want to hear this story about the lighting bills. Remember the story you told me about <laughs> the lighting I, bills that you were receiving as a program director in Chinatown? Yeah. I, so tell so us. When I started in 1990, I go, what's this bill for Spofford Alley? We're, we're, put, we're, we're paying for them. And, and also Ross, I guess. We put up these lights because it wasn't safe at, at night and the city didn't have adequate lights, you know, and until your master plan, I think. Uh, but anyway, um, yeah, it so, seemed like- So you like called was... somebody. Did you call somebody or did you did you go see somebody at BSM? Well, first I called Gordon Chin, the executive director. Go, Why do I have to pay this, man? You know, and he, he goes, just pay it, you know, let it go. Oh. But, but it triggered something in me that said, this is not fair. Why? Right. Are we paying for 
lights in right. the alleyways. You know, yeah. there were kids that got beat up in the uh, Spofford and uh, the lighting. Um, well, anyway, every alleyway improvement is based on people's concerns and complaints. And that's where the partnership with DPW comes in. And having you there was kind of nice. And having my Bye. brother Ed Lee there, Bye. It kind yeah. of helped. In the, <laughs> in the yeah, place. no, I mean, definitely these, um, you know, again, the city staff. And so at the time when I was a grad student and I was doing my master's thesis research, we found out um, through the research, the work that I was doing, that majority of the alleyways are actually dedicated and public streets, um, you know, that um, fall under the category of, you know, being able to receive city services. Um, such as maintenance and cleaning, uh, but that wasn't so in your no. experience. No. Um, and until the time that you brought this to the city's attention. Oh yeah, uh, the DPW mapping guy, I forgot his name, Troy or? I don't, anyway. yeah, I don't recall, but it was Bureau of Street Use and Mapping that, that we have a, uh, you know, a, a city um, record book that, you know, records uh, city streets in terms of the dimensions, um, you know, widths and, and, and also whether they public streets, private streets, they, they you know, uh, public streets are accepted for maintenance, dedicated. So there are different categories uh, that the city recording, you know, city BSM reports. And so through that document, we found that many of our, the Chinatown alleyways actually fell under that. But there were two, I think, alleyways in the core area that wasn't really public streets or dedicated. So we actually legislated. We went through a legislation process um, that was led by Chinatown CDC to make them public street. And so we succeeded in that. So I think majority, if not all of the, the core area alleyways are now public streets and dedicated, you know, for, for maintenance and such. Um, I, rem I remember Jasmine um, um, arguing with this guy. I go, wait a minute. You means we have to clean up our own alleyways because you, for this bogus reason, like it's not wide enough. But cars come through. Come on, I mean, it, it was yeah, it was a little hot then. <laughs> yeah, so it, there was some challenges, but I think having the master plan, the yes. document that actually, you know, the master plan document, um, as you recall, was a, a you know a culmination of a I think it was like a two two and a half year community planning and process um, where we you know talked to merchants and residents and surveyed lots of people and talked to lots of different groups and heard, you know, many different stories, as you're saying, with the community's needs. And then we put together this document to sort of prioritize, you know, which alleys we're going to get this, you know, initial, I think we had $2 million to implement right. the first yeah. few alleyways. And I think we've done 15 or so since, but, you know, phase money, one is done. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So money's ran out, but but we knew money was going to run out. So we prioritize it in such a way that you know the most important sort of in you know need alleys were, were done in that first round. Um, yeah, so it's um, you know the the youth program that you started that you mentioned Triple A. I call it the Triple A. Is that correct? Adopt an alleyway association. Um, is that still around or is, is that still under Chinatown CD? Could you talk a little bit about the AAA and what the, the youth, you know, the youth volunteers, what do they do for the alleyways that bring attention, you know, in terms of their needs? So Adopt an Alleyway, when we started with those eight youth, they went through the alleyways every Friday and graded them A to F since the adults judge us in school. We're going to judge them. <laughs> and, uh, and then I, my friend at the San Francisco Independent put those grades in the newspaper and then in the Chinese papers. And all of a sudden, the alley started looking a little better. And in fact, um, um, this summer, AAA and, and the Chinatown Alleyway Tours Program is going to re-monitor over the summer, get new youth to mm -hmm. monitor the alleyways. And mm -hmm. the dream behind the dream behind that really was I wanted the next generation to be proud of our community and engaged. And in the end, we've created leadership. Some of them, uh, you know, are, are aides to supervisors now. 
and look mm -hmm. at you, you run in the shop, okay, yay, just, mm -hmm. and, and so this is more about how um, in, we started off bad institutionally ignoring, you know, what happened in Chinatown to working together with all kind of DPW folks to make us proud. And sometimes when uh, you take pride in the work, you help empower our community as well. So for example, um, Joyce Alley, which was just done, I helped uh, a DPW person do the first public uh, meeting and uh, over a hundred people came and uh, the cops came because I knew the homeless guy that died in the alley because the lights are too dim. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. it, you know, when you make it meaningful, not, we're just not renovating streets. We are rebuilding livelihood, safety, everything in those alleyways. So it's a big deal. And it is, I, yeah. yeah. I, and, I mean, alleyways are lifeline. Like, you know, alleyways in Chinatown are very, because you and I have been to many Chinatowns all over the country. Right. The alleyways in San Francisco's Chinatown are so unique. It's not just because they, you know, were here prior to even the city became a city. Um, you know, Yerba Buena, there was a little town called Yerba Buena, and there was these little so so the, these alleys initially were created by by immigrants community where they came from China or you know, parts of parts of the you know China where they had uh small streets and little shortcut alleys to sort of make these footpaths become sort of, you know, back streets or front streets of the sort of like smaller village scale homes. And so Chinatown to me, the, the uniqueness of the, these alleyways in Chinatown is this sort of small village-like quality that we still have because we have a residential community and we have, you know, sort of a very well mixed use. It's not a, just a, you know, number two tourist most you know visited tourist uh, community, but it is a home to many uh, immigrants still. Uh -huh. um, correct, and so I think I think that is the unique aspect of the Chinatown alleyways that they're not just back streets, but they are front streets. They are probably sometimes the only open space some of the folks have on a daily basis. Yeah, and. Uh... Starting uh, this summer too, we're starting the in-person Chinatown Alleyway Tours program, and everybody in DPW should yeah. go on that tour and let the youth tell you the history of each alleyway. <laughs> I love the youth program because you you are empowering youth to you know to to have um, skill sets and leadership skills, but also having pride in their own culture in the community and at the same time helping Chinatown, right? Helping to preserve and promote Chinatown as a community. What a, what a great program. And I'm, I'm glad that is still going on, um, that it's even expanding. Um, so yeah, so that's, um, you know, I mean, Chinatown, let, let's just talk a little bit about Chinatown as a model uh, community, because uh -huh. you as a leader of Chinatown have you know, like I said, we've seen many Chinatowns all over the country. Um, just tell us a little bit in your experience, just kind of, you know, how San Francisco Chinatown is 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 a model for many other, because this is our second, I think, biggest you know, Chinatown in the country after New York, I believe. Um, and so, but they, you know, there are Chinatowns in Boston, Philadelphia, Seattle. I, rem I still remember the trip that we took as staff of CCDC, where we, you know, toured the country and met so many other uh, folks who are who are trying to right. work to preserve and and you know extend the life of their Chinatowns. So just talk a little bit about that experience. Yeah, you know, the we started at National Capacity, which is all the Chinatowns, Japan towns, Thai towns across the country, and um, the key to to preserving our neighborhoods and Chinatowns, and we're the best, even compared to New York or Boston, because we put residential interests mm -hmm. first, and then at Chinatown CDC, we back it up with affordable housing. Right. We just we just um, recently took over public housing, 
and the national Mali device. And we now own it and run the Ping Yun's 438 residents. So keeping residential interests, even the price at restaurants low, <laughs> lower, um, is really important. That that why do we do what we do to promote the neighborhood and to promote the community? And with that in mind, um, that'll uh, I think that's why we're the best. Plus, we're the oldest. I'm with the right. Presby I'm with the Presbyterian Church in Chinatown, and we're the oldest Asian uh, serving uh, church in America. Mm -hmm. And there's so many firsts just in our Chinatown. We need to share that history and right. keep it going. Keep it going, exactly. And it is. Oh, it is I, I forgot yeah. one more thing. National motto. Um, I got the White House Champion of Change Award from Obama. I remember that. Yeah, yes. and I remember was, that President it was Obama. Because of, it was because they loved the youth engagement, not just with alleyways, but visiting the seniors in the SROs and then um, them offering, uh, what do you call it, um, emergency preparedness trainings. Mm -hmm. We got earthquakes too. So we have become a big national model. And you know this, Jasmine, that other cities ask about how do we save our alleyways? Totally. I have gotten many calls from many different folks. And, and even within our city, I've noticed since we've done Chinatown alleyways many, many years ago, that, you know, many of our backstreet alleys in South of Market and a lot of other areas, you know, there is a, a huge interest to kind of really revitalize and re revamp and, and really make those quality spaces, you know, for all. So, yeah, no, I, I do remember the, the award, the, you know, President Obama, um, you know, he himself, I, you know, what community organizing sort of role and background and the, the you know, the, the relationship that you had with him, that was very, um, very interesting. Um, yeah, so, uh, you know, you know, Norman, you are still, you know, I think you hit on the fact that the reason why Chinatown uh, as, as, as a community here is so unique and, 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 and so vibrant still is because of our residential, you know, being able to, because I think still 80% or so of, of Chinatown's population is Asian, um, you know, folks of Asian descent. And I was actually in Chinatown recently um, in the last month or so because Wentworth Alley was being yes, done. Yes, beautiful. <laughs> Public works, you know. Um, Good job. Who Nadia did that? Anybody Rodriguez, out there listening? Yes, who is a, a landscape architect, you know, architect from our group, did the work for, for the, um, you know, for the uh, project and in working with, you know, public works operations, did the repaving. They did a tremendous, great job. Um, so we took the old pavers. You know, this is like, when Valley, I think is about almost a dozen, 12 to 15 years old already. And the fact that these pavers lasted this long and, uh, it was amazing. But anyway, so I was walking the street looking at the what the new Wentworth Alley and but that I was, was just cool. marveling at how clean and um you know even as you know there's tourists coming back into the streets and also just uh, the residential life that is still very vibrant, you know, folks shopping, um, you know, grocery shopping, walking on the streets, families eating in the restaurants. Um I was just so, um, you know, happy to see that our Chinatown is still very vibrant, you know, post pandemic. Um, so that's that's a nice thing. And that has a lot to do with the work of Chinatown CDC. And I think that affordable housing part is a key to really, you know, keeping these neighborhoods alive um, for many generations to come. Yeah, I, I'm uh, very proud of uh, the generational um, thing. I was worried as a Chinatown kid, you know, who would care for the community uh, that didn't, you know, live here as much, you know, every, so Chinatown has become, you know, adopted by everybody in San Francisco in many ways for various reasons. Um, during SIP though, we, we had to get youth and others to deliver food. Uh, to the SROs because you know it was too dangerous for them to use the community kitchens and all that. So we found that a lot of people care about Chinatown outside too. And that's mm -hmm. that's really cool. Right. 
Well, so we have another a few a few minutes uh, left over for our questions, and you know the last question that I'm going to ask you is um, just kind of you know what what do you see as sort of the biggest need still in terms of you know Chinatown today from your observation? You know, um, yes, there's housing and there's you know constant sort of maintenance and cleaning and and those kind of you know, what are, what are still, you know, are there sort of, you know, major issues or problems or, or areas that you like to see addressed um, in Chinatown today? So, well, right now everybody knows the API hate and people mm -hmm. beating up on grandmas and, and robbing. And so we need to make it safer in our community too. Uh, the businesses, we got to support them and they're closing up some of the small mom and pop places. We, we, we got to make it attractive again. And so that's why we're going to focus more on the tours and uh, trying to, um, I guess, get alleyways covered more, more eyes, the better. Um, um, one of my old youth from the 80s runs the Golden Gate Fortune Cookie Factory. That's my kid there, Kevin. He's been on TV a lot. He has, yes. Yeah, and, and we need to, okay, clean up all the illegal dumping that's going on still. We still, hi, maintenance folks, right now, power <laughs> to you. Um, uh, the alleyways, we cost you way a lot. And you go, oh man, you know, you just fix up what, what, what there's a whole bunch of litter there. Come on. Okay, and anyway, but, but I think I have hope. Um, I think there's enough love out there for um, the community and DPW, you guys have to really appreciate the work you do with us. It's, you know, it's just not a, you're helping to save a neighborhood. You're helping to make it safe. And, um, and so my, my main conclusion would be that power to you. You guys take pride in the work. Show your families the alleyways you worked on. Show off a little. Spread the word. And uh, in order to make San Francisco more cleaner and safer and looking beautiful. Uh, oh, I forgot. Ah, Jasmine. Yes. 19, okay, when I started the Adopting an Alleyway Youth, all right, monitoring, right? We expanded. We use, I got money from the new Neighborhood Beautification Fund. Mm. So. So we got every high schooler, whether it was a Chinese club or whatever, to come to Chinatown and they um, they got paid 15 bucks each mm. for their school program. They went mm -hmm. back to the school, not to. Mm -hmm. and it, so we started a huge movement where thousands of people have helped mm. clean Chinatown. And, yeah. Yeah. And so that's bigger than that's, just the monitoring. Yeah. No, that's great. Um, that the 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 schools are benefiting as well, you know, going the money going back. Um, well, thank you, Norman. Uh, before you know, we we're gonna have you have a few final words at the end after the you know question answer oh. kind of a session from the the audience here. But before we go into Q and A uh, from from the group here, I like to show. I'm a landscape architect, so I like to see visuals. Um, so let's show a, a quick, um, you know, uh, a few a few slides of um, Chinatown alleys um, and you know, kind of stuff that we just talked about. So this is the early study of um, the potential of you know alleyways as you know providing additional open space for Chinatown. And this was a study done that I mentioned by an architect named Yui Ho, who was my Berkeley professor. And that's how I started to connect with Norman. Um, but you know, these alleyways, the picture that you see on the right here, this is Wentworth Alley from the 1800s, you know. So these are these alleys go way back, you know, in 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 the in the history and um, you know of, of the city. So let's go to the next slide. Oh, so this is the Charlie Chinatown Alleyway Master Plan, the document on the left that was published in 1998. And then the map on the right actually shows the 41 alleyways that we studied in the master plan and you know, prioritized. And as I mentioned, about 15 of those alleyways have been primarily fully renovated. Um, 
So let's go to the next slide and some pictures of some of the alleyway renovations and openings. Um, here I am in Hangar Alley in 1997. So I was a youngster back then, but Norman, I don't know if you were in this picture, but um, you know, I remember that I was day there. clearly. <laughs> okay, probably you were, yeah. <laughs> and Waylon Chu, who's a community organizer um, from Chinatown CDC standing next to me, uh, you know, uh, translating and doing, you know, all the community organizing work. Um, so let's go to the next slide. Just a few pictures, a few more pictures of the alleyways. Um, Waverly Alley is an interesting two block alley. A lot of movies and, and film have been, you know, TV shows have been shot over here. Um, when, we, when we started the renovation, one of the key components, Norman, if you remember, was the undergrounding the overhead wires. Yes. And oh, I, that was I, beautiful. Yes, the, I highlight the overhead wires because back then PG&E had a program called Rule 20, if you recall, where they put in money, um, you know, towards undergrounding of these overhead wires. So we took advantage of that in the master plan in Chinatown. John Alley, we un undergrounded uh, Spofford and also Waverly. So, you know, that was a, a, key, a key improvement that we did. Um, Jack Kerouac Alley is uh, another alley that bridges you know, North Beach and Chinatown. And we have quotations in the ground from, you know, sort of the West meet East kind of, um, you know, uh, inspirational quotes in the, in the ground um, as part of our design. Um, so next, um, next slide. I don't know if that's, we have next slide. I think that might, oh, good. Jack Kerouac might be the last slide. Yeah, yes. that's the last one. So there, there you go. So yeah, so just a little feel for the audience here of what some of these alleys are, but please, you know, be sure to take a look yourself and go on some of these tours that Norman mentioned, especially the youth tours. Um, so with that, I'm going to get, uh, get give this back to Robin, who's going to facilitate the rest of the session. Thanks, Thank Norman. You. Thank you so much for, um, you know, giving us a visual, Jasmine and also for this conversation. Um, Chris McDaniels, um, did you wanna come on and share a little bit about the work that Operations has been doing recently in Chinatown you put into the chat? Uh, yes, uh, good, good afternoon, everyone. Um, Reverend Fong, you and I go way back to the uh, uh, late 90s. We worked together on several projects. I put those projects in the chat. You and I worked on the Dragon Lights on Grant. Oh, yeah. Uh, Avenue way back when. Yeah. Uh, you remember the commercial street uh, issue with Jason Bly? Oh, man. Oh, I want to forget it. <laughs> we had to build the brick medallions on commercial. Remember that with Ed Lee? Yeah. Um, we also did the reconstruction of Waverly Place that you showed back when I was a contractor. Uh, we also did the bulb outs on Stockton. Oh. Uh, Ed Lee wanted me to make sure there was enough room for pedestrians to walk up and down Stockton and offload all the uh, produce. So we did that project together. And then remember when uh, Gavin was mayor and we had the water main blowout on Pacific between oh. Stockton and Grant. So you wow. and I, you and I worked on that project together. It looked pretty bad when it happened, but we got it back together uh, very quickly. So I just wanted to say thank you for all you done for the community. Uh, I am the superintendent over SES, which provides all the cleaning services here in town. So oh, I, just I need your cell number. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you mentioned uh, Sheetway, so um, we we communicate on a daily basis, by the way. Uh, but we appreciate all the community help because we can't do it alone at Public Works. We need community groups, we need residents, we need property owners to help us. It's a citywide um, issue. So we can't do it alone. So I just wanted to thank you, the community and the organization for helping us uh, keep the city clean. So All thank right. you very much. Well, thank you, man. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you, Chris, for um, putting all of those projects into the chat. And today he is acting deputy director of operations. Wow. Two, two days, just two days. <laughs> 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 um, you know, if there are any other comments or questions, go ahead and put them in the chat or you can come um, on camera and on mic. Um, I wanted to throw out a question about, 
you know, as you saw the alleyways improve, um, how did that impact residents, especially the youth? You know, it's like um, moving from the 1980s and a little bit of the 90s of nobody cares about Chinatown. There's not one uh, supervisor from Chinatown. There's not, you know, we, we had a, such a little voice. And then the youth that got involved in the 90s, the thousands, let me tell you, they think they can change the world now. <laughs> you, you, you guys got to hire some of them, right? <laughs> but um, the, whether it's mundane uh, work or exciting big stuff in the news, it really doesn't matter. Our goal is to fix up the city and make it work and build community. And so like Chris, I mean, it's little problems that you got to deal with that are not fun. And, but if you keep it in the big picture of the overall impact of what we're doing together, I, I just want to uh, inspire all of you to take your work. Don't take it too lightly. It's a big deal, <laughs> you know, some of the stuff. Well, I also wonder, I mean, we're talking about partnership and uh, the public private partnership between Public Works and CCDC. And those partnerships, the issues that come up are not always gonna be something to smile about. There can be tension. Yeah. So do you wanna talk at all about um, a contentious moment and how that got worked out? You know, um, in the beginning with the master plan and the renovations, I remember local businesses, a, a sewing shop, screaming at yelling at me and digging up the brand new concrete that put in uh, stuff like that it, it's just going to happen I, and we have to smile and take it but i think if dpw works more with every neighborhood and we help get the community buy-in more it'll make all our jobs uh better and easier mm. I remember the time when uh, we we was we successfully removed on street parking yeah. from Beckett and Wentworth yeah. to legislate that, and you know even Jack Kerouac was a street before it became a pedestrian lane, and we had right. to legislate that. Mm -hmm. And those were not diff, you know easy challenges mm -hmm. to overcome because I think we needed both the city and the community yeah. Yeah. to to you know be on board and um but you know i mean i think even though you as you were saying maybe some some folks were not too happy initially for losing a parking space parking space but you know the 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 impact of what you see today is is tremendous like when i go to beckett and wentworth i'm not seeing you know people urinating behind you know parked cars and garbage dumped over, you know, next to a parked car. I mean, those were the issues that we had. Um, yeah. So anyway, so I think they, they are some, you know, really good impact to the community. I think uh, if I have some concluding remarks, I want um, We have a little, we have a little bit more time. Oh, we have more time? Oh, okay. Yeah. I'll wait, I'll save my two words. Okay. Yeah, let's go out with a bang. So hold that. Um, another question I had is, you know, both of you talked about the national model that this has set and being contacted by Chinatowns um, across the country. Um, in San Francisco, we have cultural districts, and that also is part of the public-private partnership. And so I was just wondering if other cultural districts um, have talked to you about this work that you've done or no, sought your okay. advice. We actually got started uh, in um, Kearney Street, the International Hotel with the Filipino community. So we're, we're in touch a lot. And we care about their loss. I mean, we stopped, you know, the financial district from coming up to destroy Chinatown. But Manila Town was pretty much wiped out. And so the preservation of communities is mm -hmm. really important and now there's a pacific islander cultural district and and uh, you know people galvanize in the fillmore you know bayview when, all these different places norman, I, 
I think we also, we as in Chinatown CDC also um, collaborated a lot with Japantown. Oh yes, yeah, we remember that. I remember <laughs> I working remember. with the Japantown community yeah. because the concern was, you know, Japantown was fading away. This was in the in the nineties, um, and you know, we started a lot of conversations back then and worked with many many uh, organizations in Japantown. Do you recall that? Yeah. Oh yes, I remember. We helped them with the studies, and even today, we are. I'm a part of uh, the J Town and uh, Fillmore. Um, Western edition folks, uh, we, we call our group, we are one. Mm -hmm. and, and we are one in terms of dealing with institutional racism or even just hate all over. And that impacts our, our neighborhoods as well. Well, before I hand it over to you for your closing thoughts, um, I just wanted to reflect the comments in the chat um, you know, we got to thank you for all that you've done in the Chinese community. Um, we have someone who was a participant in the Adopt an Alleyway program in high school. Um, and then a shout out um, to Jasmine for sharing the photos, the before and after on Waverly and Jack Kerouac. Um, so there's just a lot of appreciation for the work that both of you have done. Um, Reverend Fong, go ahead, take it away and let's close us out. Oh, I always close out our meetings uh, and maybe DPW can do it too. And it's decades for me to get everyone to buy it, buy into it at Chinatown CDC and all the thousands of seniors and youth that we work with. But I always start off the meetings with two words. You're beautiful, okay? Say that to each other. You're beautiful and DPW is making our streets and alleys more beautiful as well. So you're beautiful. That's it. Thank you so much. Thank you everyone for joining us. Um, tell a friend that they can find this recording on the hub. And um, with that, I hope you all have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you.